good. I apologize to keep you guys waiting, um, but welcome to this Board of Education meeting on June 8th. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, has everybody had a chance to review the agenda? If so. I make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. So we have the schedule for, tentative schedule, I guess, for board meetings in 23-24. Hopefully you've had a chance to take a look at those. Anybody? Comments? Questions? All right. Um, next item, student advisors to the board. And I will pass that to Dr. Simpson. Yeah, super excited. Uh, good evening to everybody. Um, we had the opportunity uh, the final week of school to interview for the student advisors to the board for the 23-24 school year. Um, involved in that were myself, Dr. Adams, Dr. Irvin, and the um, two current student advisors, uh, Janiah and Jonathan. Um, we had a number of applicants that came through. Uh, we interviewed five of those students, and I'm excited to share that the advisors to the board next year will be Reagan McCoy and Ali Schultz. Um, I've met with them afterward just to kind of orient them on what their role is as a student advisor to the board. Um, and they're super excited and I know we'll do a good job and they'll both be here in August um, at that first board meeting so any questions related to that or um, again the process they have to answer uh, they have to write an essay about their interest um, what skills and about them would contribute them to be effective in the role and then what they hope to to learn and for us to benefit from as a result of their participation it, all the students did a great job. Just a quick question. I was curious, um, with the others that applied, or is there some other yeah. kind of advisory group that great. you have of students? That's a great question. So when I follow up with them after that, I give them an idea of a lot of the different committees, because we're always looking for students to serve on committees, and we've always worked with the high school, in particular Mickey Herb, to get students for committees. But we, we put that. Um, opportunity out to them and um, so far I've heard back from one of them interested in participating in a committee so yeah and some of you will remember Reagan she was a part of our strategic planning committee too so she's great yeah any other questions all right we're excited to meet them in August um, next board policies BDDH1 and BDDB2 which I'm sure you remember. First one is the public engagement policy, which has in it um, the new law that will go into effect in July that allows members of the public to place items on the agenda and also speaks to how we manage our public comments. Anybody have thoughts? <coughs> I just wanted to add to that too, um, if I can't, can I add? Yeah, go Okay, go. Um, is that with that policy, what we did following some feedback is we added um, from the last read a segment at the end that spoke to, um, let me pull it up here. All right. We, we put up there, first of all, the last item that the board requires that comments be respectful of individuals and points of view, um, and that the board objects to public comments and actions that disrupt the normal business of the board. Um, 
And my curiosity for you all too was in I, in number two, it speaks to that the the board agenda. Um, it says any board member wishing to speak, a non-board member wishing to speak in a meeting must register their desire to do so. And the board agenda topic to which they will present with the secretary to the board uh, before the meeting called to order. Um, if that was something that the board would want to do, we talked about that last time. Do we want to require that it be tied to an agenda topic or not? Um, and so there was some different dialogue on that. And so I think we just have to decide as a board kind of what the direction you want to take on that. Can you give us a sense of the survey results that came back? Sure. Um, I had heard from, we put it out if people wanted to weigh in um, after, after last week's, a few weeks ago's meeting, and the two people that had weighed in um, favored the having the agenda items uh, or the comments be tied to um, an agenda item, um, but with the caveat that how is, how is the board creating um, opportunities, additional opportunities to um, interact with community members on particular topics of interest that might not be an agenda item. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. So I just felt like um, we, need to, we just need to do a, a diligent job about being available. I know we used to do you know, meet the board and things like that. I think we just need to make sure that we're offering those types of opportunities um, if we're going to hold public comments to agenda items on, you know, whether it's this meeting, I think it's the current meeting and the previous meeting, um, because, I mean, the, the hope is that we're focused on the agenda and we're focused on that meeting, but obviously we need to keep the door open to hear any and all feedback. And I know we get that in email uh, from time to time, but I think it'd be better, obviously, at one-on-one. -on -one. So I think re-looking into community engagement and how we can be um, available is, is important if we're going to do that. Can I have, it? oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Thank you. I just have a wondering, how often are the public comment, like how often are they not on, focused on the agenda? Um, I guess I mean, that would be my wondering to make a change like this. Are, you know, are the board meetings during public comments, are they not focused on the agenda? And are we, are we finding that that happens more often than not? So is it a necessary change if there's no data to kind of warrant that kind of shift? You know, I can't, I can't put my finger on it, but I have the data. Sherry went back and looked at it. And I would say that very little of the time is the public comment focused on a particular agenda item, very infrequently, currently. But that was one of the things that I feel like the public <laughs> spoke to is that they want to be able to weigh in on agenda items. So, I mean, I think providing that public comment on agenda items makes sense. I think where the public comment falls would then need to be moved probably prior to that, prior to that's on that agenda and the previous agenda. I would agree. I think I'm, I'm concerned if we, so thinking about it, I think the concern is for me is if we limit, we put those types of parameters, I wonder if you can't make a board meeting or, you know, life happens, but you're still a member of the community and just our responsibility to be able to be, you know, available and allow that transparency. That's the only thing that concerns me about putting those types of parameters on what you can say in public comment. Um, because it's just it's feedback um, so that's the only thing I would ask us to think about is it is it something that is a necessity has it been so distracting at meetings um, that it needs to I mean that I would think that we would need to do something like that if meetings were being derailed and it was time-consuming but I just haven't had that experience granted this is only meeting three for me however <laughs> um, I just don't want to cut off voices either or the opportunity to speak freely so any other thoughts um mine's more of a clarifying question i guess are we if we are limiting quote unquote two agenda items are they current and past did i 
the, like the previous meeting and the current meeting? I think that's so that if someone, that. okay. Yeah, whatever okay. direction you all want to go. Yeah, they could, you could put whatever parameters on it. And I don't think the idea behind it, and again, this came from MSBA, not from, and I, I don't honestly have a strong opinion on it, but I don't think the idea is to limit the public's ability to reach us. I think it's the idea that the board meeting is for, as a time for us to conduct the business of the, of the district. And there's a lot of other ways people can reach out to us, whether that's through phone calls or email or meetings, or to Alex's point, maybe we need to set up another time, um, if that's the way we go, for people to be able to reach out and come find us. Yeah, that's a good reminder. Like this is not, this is not us making this, uh, this verbiage. This is right. MS, MSBA. And I think their intent is just to make sure that you're focused on the district business, not on whatever mm -hmm. extraneous topics. Alan? So what I'll say is I, don't, I also don't have strong opinions. I do think there is um, room and lots. If you look at our typical agendas, there's always things that are there, typically like board policies, like um, personnel, like there's some of those budget adjustments are there regularly. So there's things regularly that give a pretty broad view. I don't, also don't want to cut off voices as well, but I, it's about finding that balance um, for the business of the board. But I don't have strong opinions one, one, one way or the other, but I do think we need to have some understanding as a board, if we do make this change, how we are interpreting what these policy or these um, agenda items are and how broad, because some of them can be pretty broad, right? There's a personnel report you can talk about staff if if policies are on the agenda can you talk about any policy like you know decision trees like that we need to think about and have an understanding for ourselves but also for the community so they know how to engage with us as well when the other factor is if it's not on the agenda after this policy goes into effect you'll be able to put items on the agenda that's correct so that if you have an issue that is not currently being discussed or that you think we're not aware of, you have the ability to put it on the agenda going forward. Thanks, I appreciate the discussion because I know I was of the opinion that we should allow our public comment period to be open. But can I know, do we still, will we still have the written correspondence or I'm sorry, written public comment? Available. I think that's also to be determined. Yeah. That's not a part of the policy. That's been a practice that we continue. We started in COVID and we continued. Um, so we don't necessarily have to address that in the policy. You can address it in the policy or. Yeah, I'd be very much in favor of keeping the written public comment, particularly if we're limiting it, we should at least give the public that sort of opportunity to provide communication and feedback and that can be on um, in, a, in, in a public comment as well. So then would you feel like the written public comments would still have to be tied to an agenda item? Mm. <laughs> it's it's good like question. Have to be I would consistent. say so. Yeah, um, I think it would have to be consistent. But to um, Grace's point earlier, if you were to miss a meeting and had gotten, life had gotten in the way, then you could um, if it's for this, the current meeting and the previous meeting, you, and you missed the previous meeting, then you'd be, able, you'd be able to address that in writing. But again, I don't have strong opinions either way. So I know I'm talking a lot for someone who doesn't have strong opinions. Anybody have a strong opinion on this? <laughs> Something? I don't have a strong opinion. I have another question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the, I hate to use the word limiting, but the point of that really, like you said, is to kind of keep focus on the meeting and not have it go for hours and hours and hours. Written comment is posted, but it doesn't necessarily lengthen our meeting. Am I making myself clear with that? So I, I, am not a, I am okay with written comment. I mean, People have to have a way to be able to reach out. So I'm okay with written comments, not necessarily having to do with the agenda, if that's what it comes to. 
I, I'd just say for consistency, they should be the same. So if we're going to do one for one, they sh we should do one for the other. And it doesn't stop people from writing to us and, and reaching out. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we need to make, if we're going to do this, we just need to make sure we're available so people can talk to us and make sure that we are aware of, you know, issues that don't pertain to a specific agenda item on our meeting or previous meeting. Um, I just look at this as a way to stick to the meeting and get through the meeting in more than, quicker than two and a half hours or however long it typically takes us. Can I ask, um, so if, if we do move in this direction and we follow MSBA, then is there a chance and what does it look like if we, you know, how do we assess this? See if it's working, if it's not working. Well, I think that's hard to assess, but I think we will have to think about other ways to engage with the public, whether that's going back to having Saturday mornings at bread company or or something along those lines where we are accessible for people to come and talk. Well, I think too, again, I think you're all pretty accessible. Um, there's always ways to be, become more accessible. We certainly, as the boards that have come before you, as some of you experienced, have had regular meetings with people. You've had been at you know, Global Brew in Rock Hill, you've been at Panera, you've been at all these places and people don't come in you know but if they have an issue or they want to talk about something they walk in that doesn't always line up with when those particular meetings are so I think the meetings and whatever are, can be continued and are good um, but what are all the different ways that yeah you're accessible yeah I mean I think we should we should try to be accessible maybe like they used to like we used to in terms of whatever Saturday morning or afternoon whatever I mean, I can say that I've been asked twice in the last four years to meet people maybe three times and I've done like it hasn't <laughs> sure you know I, it's not a it's not an issue if someone wants to meet I don't I imagine that's the same uh, more or less across the board it doesn't happen all that often but I would agree with John that we're all uh, I think we're all pretty accessible if someone wants to meet up and I'd much rather meet up and discuss rather than find out about an issue here that I have no idea about or that, you know. And that you can't respond to. Can't really, yeah, and I can't even respond to it because that's the public comment rule. So it doesn't seem, it, like, let's have a two-sided conversation. So when do we need to make a decision about, like, is there a timeline, a time frame that this has to... We have to make a decision? Yeah, by July 1st. Oh, okay. why? Yeah, so this meeting was the time to make that decision. The board could always meet again if you want to. You can approve something right now to line up with the statute, and you can revisit August 4th at the first meeting <laughs> if you want. Um, but we have to have something approved by July 1st. But the decision of whether it's tied to an agenda item or not is not statutorily, you know, it's, it's your discretion. And so that could also change, should that have to go into place so we feel like people... Sure, yeah. So I think for me, I don't, I don't feel, I mean, I don't know if it's necessary to tie it to an agenda item specifically. I just haven't, I mean, I just haven't had the experience where I feel like our meetings have been derailed. Um, I do, I think it's important for people to feel like they have a voice. Um, board meetings often are the one platform, um, you know, where folks can come and share that piece. Um, so that is, that's the only piece that niggles at me to put such tight parameters because I don't want to take away the, the purpose of that public comment piece to be able to allow people to be able to advocate um, and so limiting it to just the current agenda when I don't feel like it's been ab abused um, and I, I wonder if that's what prompted MSBA to even do this is because maybe other school boards have had that experience um, so those are the only things that are my wonderings and, and where that's niggling at me to make it so strict um, that 
I, I just that's the way that yeah, that's where I feel a little strongly like I just hate to cut off somebody's voice Secretary. my impression from MSBA is that they just feel like you're here for the items on the agenda and that's what you should be talking about and that it's not necessarily meant to be a forum for people to come and air their grievances or concerns that there are better places for that so Again, I don't think MSB is trying to stifle anyone's voice. I think they're just trying to keep board meetings rolling like they should so that we're not here till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I mean, if you think about some of the more, the bigger issues that we've had to deal with in the past four years in terms of COVID and redistricting, I mean, like all, we had very big meetings during those times and those would have all, all the, the public comments that we got during those meetings would have been agenda items. So I feel like typically the hot contested items mm -hmm. the, the community is aware of and they, right. and they come out for them, so. Yeah, I mean, I guess that, yeah, historically when it's been big board meetings with lots of public comments, it's, it is because there's an agenda item or I mean, I think about students who come to board meetings and read statements. It's a it's a point of advocacy. It's a place for them to have their voices heard. There aren't very many public forums when I think about kids where they could have their voices heard. Um, I, so that's another layer of why this is niggling to just be like, no, because I just don't feel like it's it's abused in that way. Um, like I don't think people just come to board meetings to talk about random things in public comments. Um, that's negative necessarily. I, so I, I just struggle to take away a public forum, especially for our students to be able to come and express their, their thoughts and their thinking um, because often kids don't have that kind of access um, to share their voices. Um, and by kids, I mean all kids, not just the kids that are chosen um, that are the leader, like the the, lead, the kids that we identify as the clear leaders in school, but just to give all kids an opportunity to have that. So that's that's really where my struggle is, um, to keep it tied like that. Any other thoughts, Kita? Um, I can kind of go either way. I mean, it's the same. We've never really had that many issues. Um, I'm okay. I'm okay with meeting outside of the board, and I'm also okay with not necessarily leaving it to um, agenda items. I mean, it's public, so I'm okay either way. Ellen? <coughs> <coughs> I think probably in a perfect world, I think it should be tied to an agenda item or the previous board meeting agenda item and also tie that to um, moving the public comments period earlier in the meeting so that they are speaking on behalf of something that we're going to be talking about so we can hear what they have to say and interact with them in that way. But it's not a strong feeling either way. So I could, I could be persuaded one way or the other, but in my ideal world, I think that's the way I would set it up. Um, I completely agree with Alex. I think we need to figure out, you know, it's one of our board goals. We need to figure out as many ways as possible to interact with the public and the community. Um, you know, I know those forums at Panera weren't well attended, so maybe there's different ways that we can do that, but I think that we should always be thinking about that. Like, like you, Alex, I've had you know, a handful of parents and community members in the three and a half years I've been on the board that have reached out. I've met with every one of them every time. I've never said no, but um, those aren't, well, that, that, that outreach is not often either, so where else can we meet parents where they are? Christine? I just still am of the mind that it should be open. And I wonder if going into the new year, we're putting this second agenda item that is mandated by the state. I wonder if we can just keep our public comment portion the way it is and evaluate at the end of I don't know, six months, a year to see. Now with that second um, mandated policy that we have that people can put something on the agenda, we see, you know, did that work? Does that work? Do we now have people coming in that door 
as opposed to wanting to make public comments or meeting with us in that way. I do still believe we should find ways, and it is a board goal to meet the community where they are. Um, I just wonder if we can go unchanged in the year going forward. Point of clarification, do you mean completely unchanged, or do you mean having all the different things that are up there aside from... I highlighted just like if the board wanted to motion and approve the not restricting to an agenda items and that kind of, I'm colorblind, but like yeah. that blue portion could be struck in from that policy and approved or motioned and voted on. Is that what you're saying, Christine? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I mean, isn't one of the reasons that they're adding this is because the community can add agenda items. So, if the community can add an agenda item, they can speak to what they want to speak to. I guess I just, that's the whole rationale, I think, behind that second portion. Yes, and knowing that I came to the board to say something once before I was on the board, I would, I would guess what, I would personally not have felt comfortable going to that step, but did feel comfortable, even though it was hard to come up and make a, a public statement. Any other thoughts? Do we want to vote on this? Yeah, it'd, it'd be good to vote on if we can. 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 And if we could vote on this separately and then go, so BD, can I just say BDDB? Yeah. Um, what, what was done with this particular policy from the last meeting is just, and this is consistent, again, with MSBA, consistent with our neighboring districts, is just taking out what may be included in a board meeting. Because it specifies up here different things, kind of how the whole board meeting process works. The BDDH dictates that um, like comments and all the, and the agenda items can be included to meetings, process four, but to have that may be included, you know, it just, I don't know when that got added. It was a while ago, um, but I don't. Well, it's inconsistent because some of those things are always going to be, right. and some of them will not always. So it's just easier to take, take yeah. that out because it's yeah. not serving any purpose. Yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and motion to approve BDDB2, this one. Isn't it this, that's the... <coughs> That's this one. Yeah. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. And can I make a motion on the other one that we remove? Is it right, John? The text in blue. Correct me. I mean, check, double check me, but that's what it would be, I think. Mine doesn't have that in blue. No, I just highlighted it with my cursor. <laughs> oh, got it, got it. Um, so you could just speak what you would strike, maybe? Yeah, hold or on verbalize. one second. I'm doing a search for... Um, what about number 14 as what, well? What's that? What, do you have, can you show us number 14? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Those yellow items, so when, we, when, we, when the board looked at it the last time around, mm -hmm. you looked at um, both up here, this word business, as well as this wording here on 14, was as is being shown right here with those particular highlights. But when I gave it to MSBA to send us back a clean version, they didn't have that in there, so we had them put back in. Okay, so, so that's So the only change would, would be that in blue. So, I would make a motion to remove from this policy the highlighted portion in blue. And add the highlighted portion in yellow. And add it, yeah. And add the portion in yellow. <clears throat> well, I don't know. Wait, sorry. I don't think I'm asking to approve, because we have, I'm not asking to approve the whole policy. I'm only asking to make that one change before we approve the policy, if that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because if I'm in the minority, then. Okay. 
we go forward and with as one. So there's a motion by Christine to amend the policy to remove and redact. the board agenda topic to which they will present and add number eight. Okay. No, just just remove blue. Yeah. Well, as, pre as eight presented. Eight will be. Yeah, yeah. But I don't have a problem it, with eight. Then we, if we're going to amend it, we should amend it all. We're, I'm just going to amend what we're going to vote on. Amend what's in the board docs. So then the second vote will include number yeah. eight. Yeah, okay. And all yeah. Is there a second? So the motion, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone Aye. opposed? Nay. I'm opposed. Okay. Who was that? Nay. Alan and Alex were nays. Okay. And the three of us were? Joe, where were you? <laughs> Where's Tara over here? <laughs> Motion passes then. Four two. Right. So now we're going to entertain a motion to approve the amended policy. I make a motion to approve the amended policy BDDH one public participation at board meetings. Thanks, Joe. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Nay. Aye. Opposed. Still struggling. To look, oh, we were talking about limiting this, right? No, we amended it. Oh, so can you take that blue out? I can't see it from here and read it. So the way it was amended was that any non-board members wishing to speak at a meeting must re register their desire to do so with the secretary of the board before the meeting is called to order. Okay. So redacted was the part about it has to be a tie to the agenda topic. Okay. So that passed four two. And it's currently 5 0 for you to. Okay, I'll say yes. Okay, 6 0. So it's Christine made the first there and Alan made the second. Right? Yep. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Good work. All right, moving on to budget adjustments. Ms. Frazier. So good evening. We have our final budget adjustment of the year. A couple of adjustments that need to be made. Um, on the revenue side, there are no changes at all that need to be made. On expenditures, the only change we're asking is that we're want, we want to increase the Prop S bond account by $620,000 for some invoices that have come in for projects. And then with classroom trust funds. So this is not a change in the budget, just moving it from one fund to another. We are, we're proposing to move just under $1.3 million from the teacher's fund to the capital projects fund. And those funds then once they're placed in the capital projects fund will be able to use four capital projects, mainly the Frick Theater. Um, that was one of the things that we had planned was using some of our um, fund balance for the Frick Theater project. So if we look at the budget, our budget figures show that our fund balance will end at 52.67%. But when we, um, Emily and I take a look at our budget this year, it looks like um, revenue is going to come in maybe about 2% over and expenditures about 2% under. So we're thinking the fund balance is actually going to be at about 59%. It's a little bit lower than last year, um, but a very healthy fund balance. So any questions on that short and sweet budget adjustment? Questions? Yeah. All right, we need a motion. A motion to approve the fiscal year 23 final budget adjustment as presented and any future adjustments that may need to be made to close the year. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. And back to Ms. Frazier for the capital projects fund transfer. 
So this is just a standard resolution that we ask the board to approve each, each year when we're going to transfer the full amount of an allowable transfer that we can do um, from the general fund to the capital projects fund and we won't be spending it all in this year so that's why we need the resolution because we'll be spending it some of it some of it in the future on the frick theater um, repairs at 17 selma that the board recently approved and that givens elementary lower lower level where we're splitting that with the insurance company so we just need a motion to approve that resolution. And I should point out too here, it says approximately $1.766 million. That's because once we close out the year, Desi will tell us that exact amount, but it should be in that ballpark. I'll motion to approve the capital projects fund transfer resolution. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Medical insurance. Yes, so the insurance committee met several times this year. Um, we have a great group of volunteers who serve on the committee that review um, various things. If we get any changes um, suggested to us from our, the CSD insurance pool, they'll look at those. Um, they'll make recommendations, and they're also a great resource for everyone in the building to go to them to, if they have questions about any of our plans. So we belong to the CSD Insurance Trust. There's over 20 schools. I think there's 25 districts right now, some charter schools in that. It is a self-insured pool. Our medical and dental premiums are based on our actual claims experience just for our district. And some pools that um, a business or a school district may belong to, all of the claims get pulled together. But in this one, we all keep our own um, budget and our own claims. And then the trust looks at the average of the most recent three years to calculate the loss ratio used in calculating what your renewal will be or your premiums the next year. Um, our claims have been high. We are in the highest tier. They have five different tiers, one being the lowest and five the highest. We are in that highest tier. Um, the increase for next year for the highest tier is gonna be about 12%. <coughs> The trust as a whole is looking at about a 9.1% increase, but since we are on the high end, we're higher than that at 12%. If we looked at that, if you recall, um, here at Webster, our employees pay a portion of that premium every month. So we discussed it. Um, we discussed it with the committee, and we would like to keep that the same where the employees are still paying the same amount, that $61 a month. So the Right now, the cost share is split where the district pays 92.2%, the employee pays 7.8. Next year, the proposal is that the district would pay 93.05 and the employees pay 6.95%. So if an employee does elect another plan, they're gonna see an increase and the kids plan is seeing a 16% increase um, because their claims are over what, um, the amount of revenue we're bringing in for that plan as well. On the good side, dental insurance, but that's a very small premium, is going down 1.2% or 40 cents per employee per month. So that's the recommendation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. We don't need a motion, um, but unless the board does not want to do that, we'll have to then go and amend our budget. That's why we're looking at this first, and you'll approve the budget next. If you wanted to change something, then we would make sure we did that in the budget. Any medical insurance questions? All right, moving on to the budget adoption. Okay, so of course the budget always is planned and designed each year to support the strate strategic plan. And some of the ways it does that is by providing the resources to promote a learning environment, environment that's challenging and supportive of all students. We're ensuring we have strong fiscal and operational management, maintaining our class sizes, incorporating our goal to have our employees all be at 5% over the St. Louis County median salary for their employee group. Then of course we want to maintain a competitive, competitive employee benefit package for our employees so we can retain those employees. 
And here I'm going to have um, Emily Vaughn is here, our Director of Business Services. She's going to go over some of the assumptions that we made on the revenue side and the expenditure side. And I did want to point out in your document in the board pack, um, there's a lot of different ways you can look at the budget. And it's split out by fund in there. It's split out by source. If you want to look at the expenditures, you can look at them by fund or by function or by object. Um, and there's an explanation for all of our assumptions in there, as well as some more detailed information um, about other things such as assessed valuation. Okay, thank you. Um, so our current and delinquent tax revenue, um, it is a reassessment year next year, so therefore it is going up 4.7% or $2.2 million. Um, we used our preliminary assessed values from the, co the county and we had a collection rate, uh, projected collection rate of 98%. We will most likely have to adjust the budget um, after final AV numbers are released and the tax rate is calculated in September. And then as you can see um, in, in the past, we have had in reassessment years, we've had a pretty large jump this year. It's over 150 million in assessed valuation increase. And then next year, we, or the following year, we project it will level off again as it does consistently. And then our revenue, um, as a reminder, state um, funding, the funding formula is still under the pandemic provision um, for next year. Summer school uh, ADA is estimated to be at the current year, or is the same as last year. And then there is a slight decrease in the dollar value multiplier in the formula. So there's an overall decrease of $16,000. And then Prop C, which is no longer under the pandemic provision, um, had a slight increase of $35,800. And then um, future or other increases in local revenue, we had interest earnings increase of $400,000, um, increased food service of $205,000, and adventure club and preschool increase of approximately $400,000. And then for our expenditures, um, our salaries, we met, we met our goal of being 5% over the county median, which resulted in a 3.6% or $1.8 million increase in cost. And our benefits increased 11.9% or $1.4 million. Um, once again, the medical premiums increased 12% and the dental premiums decreased slightly at 1.2%. And we did reduce um, 3.8 FTE through attrition through decreased enrollment throughout the district. And our expenditures went, at, went down about $500,000, even though transportation, food service, and property and liability insurance increased by 5%. Um, our telephone budget, we were able to reap some savings throughout the district of about 200, of what we estimate to be 240,000. And then we moved um, some budget dollars around into the supply area as well. And our supply accounts decreased over a million dollars, um, mostly from ESSER spending and the removal of carryover from uh, last year to this year. Our electric and natural gas did increase um, for about $70,000. And our capital outlay accounts increased mainly due to the bond expenditures. We added an additional 12.2 million and then Frick Theater, Selma repairs and the Givens lower level increased about a million. So that brings our total budget to 77 million, almost um, 300,000 expenditures at 91.1 million for a deficit of almost 14 million. But just as a reminder, the asterisk there, that is because of the bond funds, we received those bond funds in this fiscal year. We're just finishing right now, but we're gonna be spending a large portion of, portion of them in next fiscal year. So now if we just exclude those bond funds, we have revenue of about 69.5 million, expenditures at 70.3 million for a deficit of $778,000. That is mainly due to the Frick Theater expenses that are in there. If we take that out, we then have a slight surplus, but we do have some salaries coded to ESSER for next year that will go back to the budget, our normal budget for the following year. So really our budget is just about flat if we take those two things out. Then the debt service fund, we have about 7.3 million in revenue and 5.8 in expenditures for a $1.5 million surplus. And that will assist us in the future as we still have to issue um, about $25 million worth of bonds from Proposition S. 
And here's our fund balance, um, the dollar amounts. It's been going up and we're working on bringing that down on some one-time expenditures with the Frick and some of the other capital projects. So we're projecting that it is going to go down the next two years, but it will be higher than this amount here. And then the fund balance percentage, again, this is using the budget figures and we think it's going to be a little bit higher, around 59% at the end of this year, which will bring next year's higher as well. And then upcoming revisions, we'll be watching that tax revenue as Emily um, indicated once we get those final numbers because we're just using preliminary numbers from the county assessor. The numbers they gave us right now, um, personal property did not change at all from December. When they had to send us those numbers in March, they were not done with personal property. So that will change and I'm sure there'll be other changes too. We'll recalculate the tax rate and then we'll, we will bring that to you with the um, tax rate calculation. Well, of course, we'll monitor those bond projects and the other um, construction projects and see if we need to adjust that budget at all. Um, ESSER funds may need to be adjusted. We have to spend all of um, our ESSER funds by September of 24, but we'll see how that year goes if we're going to get most of it spent in this fiscal year, if we have to carry over any into the following year. Then, of course, we'll have normal budget adjustments as things come up. For instance, title allocations may change or we um, may move dollars from one budget area to another that will be brought to you also with a budget adjustment. The next one is to talk about the forecast a little bit. So the yellow column is our current budget and there's that $778,000. We move to next year since it will be for the fiscal year 25, a non-reassessment year. We're showing taxes going up just by half a percent. Prop C going up by one and a half percent. Other local going down 3.2 percent. We're bringing back that interest revenue back down because we think the interest rates will start going back down a little bit. Um, then state revenue is a big one with a 25 percent decrease. We're using the same ADA number that we have for the year we're finishing, carrying that forward and it shows about a 2.4 million dollar decrease in the state formula funding. Revenue for federal revenue is going down also because we won't have as much ESSER money that following year. Then looking at salaries, we have in here an estimated increase, a modest increase of 2.5%. Health insurance going up 8%. Other benefits 3 because we have to pay retirement on health insurance um, and raises, so that will go up. Purchase services going up 1% because we know some of the vendors that we pay will have an increase um, to their fee, to their contracts. And then we're showing a 5% increase to gas and electric and the capital outlays going down because we'll have some projects that will be complete. The next year then will be a reassessment year. So we're showing current and delinquent property tax going up 3%, Prop C sales tax the same at 1.5. Other local going down, we have interest going down again. And also in our other local is the generous donation from the Frick family, so that will be gone in fiscal year 26, so that's being removed. Federal revenue going down a little bit. And then a lot of the as assumptions on the salary and benefits are pretty much the same, a 2.5% raise, 7.5% for insurance, 3% for other benefits, purchase services 1%. And capital outlay going down again as we finish projects. So then that shows about a $5.2 million deficit for fiscal year 26. So we'll be working this fall, um, start working this summer, and then work more this fall on some ideas for either increasing revenue or decreasing expenditures. We'll also be watching our enrollment because as I mentioned, we use the numbers of the same ADA that we have this year. So if our enrollment goes up, and Dr. Simpson's gonna talk a little bit more about our enrollment later in the meeting, then we won't lose as much in revenue also. Um, so we have two years too, so our enrollment could go up in fiscal year 25 and again in 26. So we'll make adjustments and we'll be monitoring that. So any comments or questions? First, thank you very much, Pam, for this and family. Um, curious, when I heard the $240,000 reduction in phone costs, I'm curious what that is and if people can still get a hold of schools and for safety reasons. 
They will. Currently, teachers have individual line or individual phone um, numbers. They'll be going to a central number with an extension that they currently have that extension. They're just typically using that full phone number. And by reducing that, we were able to reduce those phone costs. Thanks. I appreciate that. One more question. Um, you mentioned the higher, we're in the highest level for the insurance pool. Is being in the pool, though, beneficial for our district? Very much so. Um, so what happens in the pool, too, we have um, stop loss insurance. And usually it's at $600,000. If a school district has an incident where sometimes when stop loss is approved, um, and bid on with the insurance companies, they may say if you have a large cost claimant, they may what they call laser that out and they don't pay it. So if we're in this trust with this pool of other school districts, that cost, which could be anywhere from 100,000 to another 1.5 million or so, is spread out among all of the districts in the trust. So it's very beneficial. Thank you. Ellen. Hi Pam, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I took note of the um, number you had up there, $400,000 in interest. Can you speak to, is that from the bonds or what is that, what, what is that interest? Um, so the Missouri state statute requires that we, um, we have such conservative investments that our number is tied very closely to that fu Fed funds rate. Mm -hmm. Right now it's been increasing um, just naturally. And so we eventually think that that's gonna fall and as that falls, our returns fall as well. So it's on regular funds and bond funds. Correct. We're all increasing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, another question is, um, and I'm not sure, Pam, if this is for you or maybe Dr. Wiley Skinner or who, but um, you said in the budget assumptions there was a 3.8 FTE reduction. Can you speak to what, what those positions are? That really felt like a long walk, sorry. Um, so each year we do a staffing analysis to take a look at what our class size ratios we would like for them to be, making sure that we are in alignment with DESE standards as well. And so in some elementary schools, there were, um, because of the redistricting that we're doing, where Givens is growing in certain schools like Avery and other schools are um, downsizing, those children are transitioning over because some of those kids are no longer in those buildings, then it means that we don't need as many teachers as we have in those buildings. And so in some of our elementary schools specifically, as well as we had a reduction also at Hickson, when those class sizes are not, like let's say for instance, if you have 40 kindergartners, typically there's gonna be about two teachers. But if you look up and you only have 20 kindergartners enrolled, that's one teacher. So it's really dependent upon the number of students that we have by cohort in each school. And so that helps us determine when we have those reductions um, with staffing. The great thing is, is that we, um, a lot of our staffing was um, captured through transfers, um, through the internal transfer process. So um, we were able to really um, not necessarily lose a teacher through that way, but we were absolutely able to transition the teacher from one school to the next in order to fill those gaps. So it was mainly at the elementary level? Then, mainly, yes. And it has been for the past th two to three years, and that's again because of the redistricting, right? So right. Givens yeah. becoming its own neighborhood school, Givens has grown maybe over 100 kids in the past year and a half or so. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, final question for me. Um, Pam, will you remind us, are we expecting um, to sell the second half of the bonds in the next budget year, is that right? I know that's not reflected in here, but as we think about the budget. Possibly. We'll be watching those progress, the projects, how they progress, and then we'll be watching interest rates as well. But yeah, sometime in the next, I would think in the next 12 months, we'll be looking at issuing those. I just have one question. Eventually, are we gonna benefit from the marijuana tax that passed? That was a really good question, but I don't think so. Okay. But I can look into that. It would be nice. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, with with the just with the projections looking um, uh, 
you know, less than great. Uh, I'd say what go, our fund balance probably going from 50% to maybe in the 30s it, if those projections were to hold true. What types of, I, or, you know, rather than putting you on the spot, are, did you say you're going to come back to the board with recommendations on uh, maybe increasing revenues or expenditures by what time period? We'll be working on um, starting the plan this summer and then working with some different groups in the fall. And then we would bring um, that as we progress through those meetings to the board and update you as we go. Okay. Thanks. Well, I think we all know it's, it's harder to increase revenue than it is to cut expenditures. So that, that's why that is one of the, the, the goals of our We've been very mindful since obviously that tax levy and the bond issue failed in 15. The board and the administration cut a significant amount of money. Um, a number of staff members lost their jobs at that point. And we've been, um, I, we've hired some great CFOs. We've been very thoughtful as administrative teams at the building level. And the fact that we're walking into 15 with a balanced budget with not having to go to the voters is a testament to some of that. But some of that has to do with, again, what Sandy talked about, how are we being thoughtful about our staffing um, and just making sure where we need staff or where we need additional staff, we add. And if there's space where we don't, then we reduce, um, mindful of you know doing so through attrition as much as we possibly can. Um, but in the foreseeable future, unless we see funding change, unless DESE commits to continuing to fund us on the levels, which we certainly can't anticipate, um, or we don't get an increased student enrollment, that, that operating levy will be somewhere, somewhere out there. Any other questions? And do you need anything from us? Make a motion to approve fiscal year 24 budget as presented. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Thank you so much to both of you. We appreciate it. Dr. Adams. Yes, good evening to all of you. I'm pleased to be here to present the federal programs report um, from the previous school year and recommendations for how we'd like to use those funds going into next year. So when we discuss federal programs, we're talking about Title I, Title II, and Title IV. Um, I want to be really clear that there are also other federal streams um, in terms of finances that we receive, ESSER grants, et cetera. This particular program or um, report will not touch on those particular areas. Um, as we move forward and I discuss the three title programs, it's also important to note that some of our private and parochial schools within the district and also institutions such as Epworth receive a portion of our funds. So when I'm talking about the overall funds, you'll see a distinction between what Webster Grove School District gets and what the um, private and non-public schools um, also receive. As far as Title I goes, um, Title I funds are designed to help school districts um, improve the academic achievement of the disadvantaged as, as it's deemed um, by the federal government. In terms of our allocations for this year, um, we are expected to receive around $162,000 and you can then see um, the Webster Grove School District portion below that. Um, I put several years previous um, up there for you to take a look at. You can see a pretty significant drop in those funds. Um, part of the reason why um, we believe we have that drop is with federal programs, um, the funds that districts um, end up getting are based on um, socioeconomic status in terms of students who qualify for free or reduced price lunch. However, there is a bit of a delay from when those numbers are used to when it impacts your funding a delay of typically two to three years. And so when we think back two to three years, 2020 or so, it's during the COVID timeframe, et cetera. And so we are now at a point where we're starting to see the decrease in terms of um, those funds. Previously, we've used Title I funds to provide additional reading specialists and instructional tut tutors to aid in the three buildings that qualify. Um, for Title I support, which are Avery, Givens, and Hudson. Title II, 
Um, this is often referred to as the PD grant, and so a lot of the funds related to Title II support learning on the part of the adults in our system. We are expected to receive somewhere around um, $77,000, $76,000, and of course you can see our Webster Groves um, expected share there. Again, also a decrease from previous years. Some examples of how we've used the professional development funds through Title II um, to support our equity training, reading support training, and also math development, and some of the um, math program evaluation information that you received several meetings ago um, was funded through Title II. Title IV supports um, student support and academic enrichment. Again, you'll notice a fairly large um, decrease in terms of the funds that we will be receiving or are expected to receive for Title IV. And those funds, I believe I skipped a slide, but those funds have provided support for our Project Lead the Way courses, along with um, several technology aspects and health resources that we've used um, to support our curriculum. Our recommendations for next school year would be to continue to use Title I funds to support the needs of our students, um, particularly focusing in on literacy and math, very similar to how we've used them previously. For Title II, we um, will continue to focus on high quality professional development and again, looking to continue um, the specific area in equity and then also looking to support areas such as literacy and math. And for Title IV, um, two specific areas. Um, in the past, we've used Title IV funds to purchase a site license that's used um, at the high school for one of our computer science programs and then also looking at a resource um, that we've used consistently the last several years for um, our teachers in terms of the K-8 health curriculum. So it's an annual renewal. And at this time, I'll take any questions. Okay, and I am seeking your approval approval of the report and recommendations for next year. All right, thank yes. you, Dr. Adams. Um, I will motion to approve the 2022-23 federal programs report and 2023-24 federal programs recommendations. I second it. All those in favor, aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you, Dr. Adams. Thank you. Now to the enrollment report, Dr. Simpson. So I'm going to give you just a, a brief report on enrollment, which has kind of been touched on. And we've been certainly talking about enrollment since the start of the pandemic when we um, started seeing a, a decline. Um, and so in your particular packet, I included the report from Dr. Charles Coffron. We've used Dr. Coffron, a demogra demographer, since prior to my superintendency, Dr. Riss had con contracted with him. He does really good work. Um, he bases his projections on um, live births in St. Louis County. Uh, and so he, um, yeah, so he creates these projections for us every year and every year the numbers of those projections, of course, adjust based on enrollment trends that he's seeing. So first of all, this is just a look, a line graph for you showing just kind of what enrollment has looked like in Webster since 2019. Uh, you will see an overall um, that decrease, that total level is at the top, a decrease of about 270 students. That's the overall increase, net uh, decrease rather. Um, at the elementary level um, is the next um, drop. And then the middle school and the high school, which aren't as pronounced as, as the elementary levels. And I'll share some data with you that kind of shows a little bit what that looked like. Um, so at the elementary level um, during COVID, we saw a number of our students leave at the elementary level um, during from 1920 to 21. You'll remember we were still 2021. We started in the virtual setting um, and there were people that left for a number of different reasons, whether it was they needed um, they needed their children somewhere so that they could work um, or they needed to have their children at home because they were going to homeschool. Uh, 
but that's where we saw uh, the level where we saw our most pronounced um, drop. What I did right here is you could just see from, just took those 19, 20 kindergartners and just what did the number look like in first, second, and then in third grade. Um, this represents um, an overall of this particular K-5 cohort in 1920 through 22, 23, a net loss of 103 students. Now that doesn't mean that 103 of the students left and um, necessarily never came back. That's reflecting just the net number. Does that make sense? Uh, and so you could see like at some grade levels with kindergarten, we started at 299, we increased by 12. But at second grade, we had 377 students and that number you know, decreased by you know, whatever it is there, uh, 340 in 22, 23. So that cohort lost a number of kids. Um, and again, the reasons were all, all around, all over the board. This is the this is the projection uh, graph that he shares with um, within within the report, and you could see kind of how he created those lines to show the the COVID kind of the COVID cliff, so to speak. Um, and so uh, what I did in his projections, remember his projections are all resident enrollment, so it doesn't include staff who bring their children to school, it doesn't include students who participate in VIC, it doesn't include students who participate in Great Circle students that pay tuition to come here. Um, so that is kind of what happened residentially. Um, at, at 1920, we were still moving forward and projections through 24, 25, we're still showing the upward trend. And then COVID hit and we had that pretty substantial drop. Um, and you can kind of, again, see that total on the side. So he projects as is detailed in the report, um, both what is like, essentially worst case scenario, well, depending on how you look at it, low projections or high projections. And there's, there's three lines that are in the middle there that are kind of, kind of blurred right now. So again, contributing to enrollment was COVID-19. There's no doubt about it for all kinds of reasons. Um, we have had and will continue to have a declining enrollment in the VIC program. Um, next year is the last year the program will, will accept new students. Um, from then on, we will continue with those students as long as they're in the program, but no students will be added. Uh, declining enrollment of students at Great Circle, and I'll show you what that looks like. So we have students that are um, through Great Circle and Epworth attend in our schools. Um, and then also factoring into the enrollment, depending on the year, classes can vary in size quite a bit. And it, sometimes it lines up pretty cleanly with birth data, sometimes it doesn't. We in uh, 2022 lost our, our biggest uh, class. The, the senior class of 2022 was 385 students. And then walking in the doors, kindergartners were 303. So that's an 80 student drop just looking at those two classes. So there's, and again, there are other factors as well why people make decisions to leave or why they have to leave, but those are four in particular. This shows the enrollment. You'll notice it's, I, I did kind of five-year increments and in 05, 06, we had 352 students in Webster that participated in the program. 10, 11, 246, 15, 16, 140. And right now we're currently sitting at 775. We'll have the opportunity to enroll three students next year. Those will be our last students in the program. Um, and part of that decline has to do with how to sustain the funding to support the students, because once they're in, they're in for the next 13 years if they start as kindergarten students. Sure. If you are in the program as a big student and you have a younger sibling, do they automatically get to come or no? Not if they're not in next year. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great Circle enrollment. Um, Great Circle um, has gone through some different things, uh, and they had uh, we had 50 students in our school district um, through Great Circle in 1920, and for the past two years, we haven't had any students enrolled. So again, that affects that enrollment number. Our Epworth numbers have been pretty consistent, actually. Uh, this just shows again that same uh, gr that same graph, that resident enrollment projection graph, and then next to it is birth trends. 
And that's one thing that's noticed, not just in St. Louis County, Missouri, but across the country, there's been a decline in birth trends. Um, and so again, that also factors into Dr. Coffron's projections. Like I said, there've been some years where we've had a lot more kids come and they're, the births corresponding with that haven't been as big. Cause again, we're not tracking the kids that were born here and then all the way through, it's just the child that moves in in kindergarten after living in Kirkwood for five years, they're included in that, in that number. So for some perspective of where we are and just looking at the kindergarten and enrollment for next year, um, feeling pretty good where we sit right now based on the projections. Again, we wanna have as many students as we, as we possibly can. On that, on that left column is, is the, the resident projections from Dr. Coffron. You could see that Avery and Bristol are already exceeding what, what he had projected for the year. Um, Clark is one away, Edgar Road is nine below, Givens is six away, Hudson is 10 away. So currently we said 14 students off of what he projected. And then I kind of put to the side there, between June 13th and the start of school last year, we had 45 kindergarten students enroll. So we don't know how many are gonna enroll, um, but that's that, that particular number. Action steps, um, continuing uh, a commitment to improve storytelling from the district. That's something that we've talked about and I feel like we've done a, a, a continue to do a better job. I credit Derek and his department and our administrators and our teachers and schools for getting out there and sharing the good stories. There's so many good stories happening throughout the district and that's an important piece of, of um, again, continuing to have people get excited about the school district. Um, this year we instituted coordinated open house events at the elementary school level. We had done high school open houses for a super long time. We had started middle school open houses for a little while. Um, and this was the first year that we did elementary open houses and paired it with the kindergarten open house event. Um, and we're going to continue that this coming year, looking to see how we coordinate that particular event K-12 across our schools. Again, with that, it's not just inviting uh, possible families into the school, but it's also inviting residents to come in and just learn more about the school system that they support in a lot of different ways. Um, continued dedication to continuous improvement through our strategic plan. Um, we've got a great school. We've, we've got a great school system, relatively speaking. We could certainly get a whole lot better. Um, and how do we continue to move forward? Um, and I believe our, our purpose, our principles, and our plan will help propel us in that direction. So our commitment to that plan is big. And then also action steps, as we talked about tonight and as evidence in that plan, is how do we continue to be efficient with resources in ways that are as far apart from our children and our teachers and classrooms and our staff working with children? How do we continue to be as efficient as we can and while we're developing plan to look at further reductions, how can we continue to, again, be mindful and show the community and the taxpayers who pay, we know, a decent amount uh, here in Webster Groves that we're being thoughtful. We're not, we're not taking their money and their resources for granted as we continue to try and provide the best experience for our community's children. So that's it and happy to entertain any questions or comments you have. Alan? Question. Um, Dr. Simpson, can you go back to the, there's one of your earlier slides that had all the cohorts. Let's see if I'm, yes, that one. Mm -hmm. So we lost in kindergarten, if I'm following this correctly, in 1920, there were two, 299. We lost eight of them moving into 21, 22, but we ended up then getting all of them back and more by third grade. Mm -hmm. Am I reading that correctly? Correct. So that's a positive. Obviously, that doesn't hold through all the grades, but that's at least probably those families that um, pulled out because of COVID or other reasons. We, we can't speculate on reasons. I shouldn't even mm -hmm. know. We don't know. We don't know. Don't know. Who, we don't know who those people are. Correct. Um, but they don't follow through um, all the older grades. So mm -hmm. I guess I'm saying that out loud to be hopeful that because we've got some of those kids back, the fact that enrollment trends for next year are in some ways ahead of what Dr. Coffin projected, mm -hmm. maybe we'll get some of that enrollment back, maybe yeah. not to the extent we would like, but I'm guessing that 
some of it might come back. Yeah. Is that a fair assumption? I know I, you can't really. Yeah, and I would that, say that but. you know, again, the numbers are the numbers, but he was suspicious because he thought we outperformed. Although we didn't have a report and a projections, he felt we outperformed this year in the number of ki kids that came based on the recent, the past few years. Um, so he's. I think his word was hopefully suspicious <laughs> um, that we might see that. And I think we are also having to be mindful, like when we had families that made the decision um, for all kinds of reasons that they also had, you know, siblings, you know, that the siblings that coming behind a lot of people have children in bunches. Um, <laughs> We didn't, we didn't do that too well as a family, but a lot of people do. And so um, that, that is one uh, hunch that he has in particular. Um, and again, we didn't see the same level of, of movement at the upper levels because children could stay home. Uh, not all of them at all, but a lot of them, a number of them could stay home in the middle school or the high school level, or there were kids that felt they were cohorting with one another, you know? Um, yeah. But with the little ones, five-year-olds and six-year-olds, um, a lot of us experienced that as parents. Wasn't easy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that's helpful. I appreciate that. I also think that it's really important as a district and as a staff, we continue to think about ways to reach out to the community to talk about our school systems. I think mm. the, those community open houses, the ones I attended, were fantastic. Yeah. And I think we need to do that again and think of other ways to reach out to the community so they can get and experience with our schools, with our curriculum, with what's going on in the classroom, because I think that um, oftentimes um, the community and parents don't have a good grasp of what that looks like. Mm. So I think being creative about thinking about ways that we can continue to do that kind of outreach is important. Mm -hmm. And I really do feel like getting through our doors. I had a conversation with a parent in a not in a professional setting not too long ago who um, parent children private school and and brought their children to our school last year and just in tears, in tears about a child that has um, special needs, special rights, and just how their child was cared for and the academics. And again, a little bit of feeling of regret of I wish I would have done it sooner. Um, but it was a really, it was a great testament. It was a great story to the work of our, again, our teachers and staff. But again, just getting them through the doors and meeting people and experiencing it, that's pretty key. Hopefully we can communicate those open houses better next year too, because I think there were people were confused if it was for everybody, Kindergarten, for kindergartners, yeah, 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 yeah. and it was such yeah. an amazing yeah. event, at least the ones I attended. So yeah. hopefully we get more people in the door. I agree. Do do we look at surrounding private school enrollment when doing that? I don't, I don't know. It no. may not be as easy to obtain, but I imagine they would want to speak to that. So we don't look at. Um, I hear some just having lived here for a long time about different schools and different trends. Uh, they don't share that as, okay. you know, the, from my experience. Um, we are able to see, again, based on the number, not necessarily based on how kids stay. Um, again, like cohort, and it's in the report, it's called cohort survival rate. And so from those, from that number of children that were birthed within our district, what percent of them came into the schools? And so making the assumption that again, kids move in, kids move out, but around that number probably is that other percent goes to private independent schools. Yeah. And we do get information, and I don't know, Jason might see it still, but back, back when I was doing Jason's role many moons ago, because you would base your Title II numbers or numbers that would go to the private schools um, had to be tied to enrollment back then. So I don't know if that's still the case. But you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? All yeah. right. Moving on to district committees. Yeah, district committees. On your attachment, and this is just a really quick presentation, um, a share really, is we included the, the different um, kind of draft district committees for next year that include, and I'm not going to go through them all, but that include board members as liaisons. 
Um, we also included on this particular um, document um, opportunities for school liaison, liaisons to cities, liaisons to outside organizations. We included on here who were the representatives during the 22-23 school year. We included a space or uh, where David was last year. Um, and so what we're asking you at this point is to take your time, go take a little bit of time, go through this particular document and then send to, I don't know, Joe or myself, I'm happy to curate, um, send your interest because the people that are there don't necessarily have to people be the people there that are next year. Um, we included also dates and times they meet. Um, I forgot to include on there, we talked about it, the different opportunities for Zoom. Um, most of these meetings are available um, to you by Zoom. Their times are all over the place, but I'll send out kind of a revised version, just making sure to note any of them that, that are Zoom options for you. Um, and again, just because someone's name is there, don't not tell, do you want them to go to you, Joe? Do you want them to go to me? Do you want them to go to... Difference. Okay, I'm happy to co collect them all and then send them to Joe and Christine to kind of make sense of it all and determine where. Does Sounds that sound good. okay? But just because the name is there, don't not put your name there. Okay. Thanks for collecting that, John. Yeah, you bet. That's it for me. All right, any questions about that? Um, lunch prices for the 2020. 23, 24 school year. Yeah, so each year we take a look at our lunch prices and Desi has actually a tool that we use to calculate what those lunch prices should be. Um, so Chartwells, as you know, is our provider for food service. They do a great job. Um, we're very fortunate to have a wonderful director, Brittany, um, who works with Chartwells and works with all of our buildings. They, just like a lot of other areas in our district, have been short-staffed, and Brittany um, and her admin assistant have been covering in a lot of the buildings, so I thank them very much for their hard work um, to make sure that our students have a lunch or breakfast every day. So the mission, of course, is to um, work collaboratively collaboratively to continue to build a program that engages the students um, with increased quality and a variety to balance the program's revenues and expenses. Some of the challenge, increasing minimum wage, it is up now to $12 an hour. Chartwell starting pay is $13 an hour, so it's above that, but $13 an hour is not a high wage by any means. We have the increasing cost of food, just like everything else, those costs are going up. Then we have old equipment that we need to um, make sure we're able to repair. So when we use DESI's tool to calculate that lunch, breakfast and lunch prices, it's showing that we should do a 10 cent increase. So at the elementary level, breakfast would go from $1.75 to $1.85, lunch from $2.80 to $2.90, the secondary level, breakfast 180 to 190, lunch 285 to 295, and then they have a tiered option lunch at the high school, which would go to 360. Then I just wanted to share, Brittany gathered this information for us. Some of it is this year's pricing because we didn't have next year's lunch prices for the district, but just to give you an idea. So if we were looking at 290 um, and yeah, 290 for the elementary lunch and 360, Three, 295 for the secondary lunch, as you can see, um, we're right in line. The only one that would be lower was Afton's um, ele elementary lunch at 290, if we look at Clayton, Brentwood, and Afton. Um, and then we also had Kirkwood and Lindbergh here. Again, their ele ele elementary lunch is 325, Lindbergh is 315, and we were looking at 290. And the secondary, Kirkwood's at 340, and their secondary lunch at Lindbergh is 330, and again, we're looking at 295. So we're really below a lot of our surrounding districts. So we're happy to answer any questions, and Brittany is here as well. Um, and we will need a motion to approve that if you so desire. Any questions? No, just thanks to thanks to you, Pam, and thanks to Brittany for collecting that information. Yeah, absolutely. 
I can motion to approve a 10 cent increase to student breakfast and lunch prices in 2020, 20, well, I guess now, 23, 24. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Any, aye. Anyone opposed? Takeda. Okay. All right. Panorama Agreement. Dr. Williamson. Yes. Good Dr. Williamson. Oh, there you are. Yes. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I um, just wanted to come before you to give some um, background information. I know Dr. Lee wasn't here last year when uh, we decided to move forward with Panorama and to discuss at the end of this um, for you all to do a, a decision or to make a motion if you want to move forward with the one-year agreement for next year. Um, so again, some background information. So when we decided to move forward based on our strategic plan, as well as with policy, ACR equity policy, that talks about, excuse me, that discusses a biannual survey that needs to be done. So we had a committee, district-wide committee, teachers, administrators, counselors were on there and we vetted several companies came down to two, our district leadership team had um, presentations to those two. The decision was Panorama Education, and we brought it forward to the board around this time last year, around April, and it was agreed upon to move forward with a pilot for one year. And then based on the discussion that we had with the board last year, several pieces were implemented. So a website was created called Climate and Culture, it addressed frequently asked questions. The survey, the actual surveys were posted. We had intentional communication with our commu communities. There also was an opt out feature uh, to make it easy for families. It was a link that was put into our SIS system. So families can go in and opt their student or students out for the entire year from the survey, but not from the platform piece. Um, and then just also for clarity, because when we have educational purposes with an agreement with a vendor, you know, according to FERPA and according to one of our own Board of Ed policies, GHDA, consent is not required from families to, to do this. And so therefore we move forward, um, proceeded with the opt out. Communication was sent to families, they could opt out. We ensure their children did not take the surveys throughout the school year. Um, and then our principals also did communicate with families in the spring semester once the year was over, because we did surveys in October and then surveys in April and May. And then the, the principals provided updates regarding to the usage of the data. Uh, in the fall, there, there was some confusion regarding terminology, because with any platform that you get, there's always a learning curve, right? So the term opt out, to some people that meant, and we put in our communication very clearly, you were opting out from the survey, not opting out from the platform of Panorama. Some families thought opting out meant you did not, meant their child's data did not even enter the Panorama platform. So there was some misunderstanding. So we did have a family, um, who contacted us and requested to have their children's data purged, was the, the term, from Panorama. And so I contacted Panorama to ask. I communicated with some of my colleagues in the St. Louis County area who use Panorama. They've never had a request to have their child's, when, and their student's data purged. It was just always opting out. So it took some time. And then Panorama told us uh, via email that they had purged the children's data from their system. That information was communicated to the family. And then fast forward in the spring, we were contacted again. The family member asked, I think my child's information is still in the system based on a survey response when the student's name was entered in to take the survey. So I contacted Panorama um, and it took a while for this to get completed. Several reasons, our account manager 
took a new position, there was a gap, it was not filled. So response time was definitely lagging as we've seen across a lot of industries um, here lately. And then we had a meeting with Panorama and what was explained to us, which is what was told to us in the fall, is that there's a two, a two layer system. So what happens is, again, because we, we have to feed the data to Panorama and then once a family member asks for it to be purged, it has to be taken out. So they were supposed to remove that student's information and then create a filter so when we do the upload in the spring, there would automatically be a filter so those children's data never enters the platform. Does that make sense? And so what happened was we weren't able to see the student's data on the front end of the user when I would type in their name but they did not completely purge them from the system on the back end. And Panorama explained that to us. And now I did receive an email from another family asking to have their data purged. And so after we met with Panorama and I had this family's data, I received an in-depth email, a Google form that I had to complete that requested um, verification and auth auth oh, I can't talk tonight. <laughs> to authenticate the students' names and their student ID that they would be in fact completely purged from the system. So went through that process and it took them about 10 days or so. And I notifi notified the family um, this afternoon that their child's data was in fact purged from the system. Okay. Um, and then as far as usage, just to give you all, um, as you recall presented on our data in the fall, and then spring data will go into the DEI report this, this December, and Jason will, will jump in here um, regarding the, the usage. But we had three, three surveys for students, if you recall. We had student uh, family survey, and then we also had uh, surveys for employees. We had two, one for teachers, and one for everyone who is not a teacher. So we had several surveys that was used. And we also have a check-in feature, but we did not roll out that check-in feature because we didn't want to overload our staff, right? As I said, with any new platform, as you all know, there's a learning curve. And so we wanted to make sure that everyone felt comfortable with using the surveys and the data and the analytics before we took that next step. And I just want to make a point. When you purge a student from the platform, they cannot have access to any of the other benefits. So for instance, if we were to roll out the check-in feature, which means teachers can pose a question to students, how are you doing? Do you have a question about the material? There's like a question bank of 80 questions. Any student who is purged would not have access to, to that feature because they would not be in the, the platform entirely. Versus if you opt out of a survey, you remain in the platform and you would still have access to the other services and benefits. Dr. Williamson, if I may, just a, a few connections to how we've used uh, Panorama in the district. Uh, just to, to remind everyone, as part of um, MSIP 6 and as part of our APR, um, part of that is a requirement that we do give a culture and climate survey. It does not specify, to be clear, that it has to be Panorama, but it is part of our annual APR that we do provide a culture and climate survey. This year, as part of our work with both academic data and social emotional data, Dr. Williamson, Tim Brown, myself, we've met several times with each of our building principals. We've discussed connections between the academic data, the social emotional data. Many of our buildings are actually moving forward next year, developing um, as part of their school improvement plan, social emotional goals around Panorama moving forward. And so um, just wanted to paint the picture of what that looks like within the district and how we've used it this year and how we continue to, to hope to be able to use the platform going forward. So if there are any questions. So currently the, is, the topic is a one year agreement for next year for 23, 24. And as Dr. Adams said, with the support of our, our district leadership team and our principals moving forward. Questions? I have one question. Um, hopefully without getting into too, too many details. If a parent opts out of the survey, what data is being collected? Am I 
Sure. No, that's okay. a great question. So how it, how it works, um, Kita, is we have to send a file. So it's our third through 12th grade students who, who we survey. So all of their information that is chosen, so like name, student ID number, race, gender, things of that nature, grade level, teacher, school, that is all sent to Panorama, okay? And then we give families the option to opt out. So if you say, yes, I wanna opt out my child, you would check that box on SIS, and then your child, then I go back on the back end and I opt your child out from the survey. So they wouldn't even, if they try to take the survey, they couldn't because it's not there but their information is still in the platform. It's like, for instance, I had several families in the spring contact counselors and say, oh no, I don't wanna opt my child out, I wanna opt them back in. And so we opted them back in, which was the easy, because they were still in the platform. That'll happen with other things too, um, like DESE, like we had, we've had parents um, more so in recent history that have made the decision to opt their children out of MAP testing. That doesn't mean that all the data and all the information on that student still doesn't, still isn't in, is still in the state system. Um, but that's, they just don't have to take the test. That's but what I was going to ask. That basic information, even when you just register for school, is going to be in a database somewhere, right? Am, yeah. I, am I understanding that correctly? In our SIS system, it okay. is. And then there's data, core data that's tied at the state level that's there. Yeah. So it's just the survey questions that, okay, okay, I'm quick. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I guess I, Panorama is a data rich um, platform. How, I guess, how, who chooses the questions? Because there's so many questions. There's a ton of questions. How do you determine which questions to use? How to drive, how do you, how, how to use that data to drive supporting students? Um, and then, does Panorama guard that data, or you know, is it open? I guess that's my wonder. I'm familiar with Panorama, having worked with it, um, and so there's a ton of data that comes in that in that in the assessment. So I wonder, does Panorama guarantee that they guard and protect that data from being outsourced to a third party? Um, I always think about the Target analogy my husband shares with me about Target watching what we buy and then sending us coupons based on our purchases. So that's, I guess that would be my concern with such young children, like with kids. How do we, are we guarding that data? Sure. So your first question with the, that you asked about how are the questions. So there was a team of us who met and as you said, so Panorama has, if we took every question for like their SEL survey, it would be about 80 to 100 questions which is crazy, right? So there's a team of us who, who met and we literally went through all the questions, the entire bank, and we chose the questions that we felt was most appropriate for Websterville School District. And then we took those, sent it out to principals, had that vetted, as well as our counselors and social workers got feedback. So it was this whole back and forth until we got the final approval from DLT. So that's how we decided on the questions for all of the students. And then regarding the employees, it also went through the leadership team and Dr. Sandy Wiley Skinner. Yep. Do teachers have, the, teachers have the option to opt out from taking the survey? Is that mandatory for teachers as well? It's not mandatory for any person to take okay. the survey. Yep. And then your second question was the use of, of data. So again, it's been used on, a, of course, the aggregate level overall from the district, just looking at how is the district doing, what areas do we need to focus on. And if you look at it by building, so our DEI survey and the school climate survey, they were completely anonymous. And the SCL was the only one that was named. And so an example of how a lot of buildings use, especially across the board, there's a question about do you have a trusted adult in the building? And so they were able to identify the students who said is it yes or no, you know, who said no. And the counselors reached out to the students. Some schools created small groups to help build that community. For those who said they had no friends or peers in the building, then they had a, a, different, a different group of folks. So there's definitely been a lot. And then with the, this is just one data point, right? So it's been paired up with other of our data sources just to give us a much more rich, well-informed picture of students. And then your last question, 
about uh, protection, yes, in our agreement, um, it's clearly stated by Panorama that personally identifiable information is not shared or sold. Um, information is shared from a research standpoint on an aggregate level, um, just regarding results overall, but nothing is identifiable by district and or students. In our family surveys, they're completely anonymous as well. But once they make that data anonymous, they can sell that data, correct? Excuse me? Once the data is anonymous in their system, then they can sell that data to whoever they want. No? On an aggregate level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we can make use of that aggregate data as well, right? We can compare like our fifth graders versus nationally fifth graders. No, we're no. not able to compare nationally because in order to do that, you have to take the entire question bank That's right. to make that comparison. And I can't speak for every school, but I know the ones in this area, when I met with, with my counterparts, none of them have taken like entire whole pieces because it would just be too, too long. Yeah, thank you for that. You're Later. welcome. Other questions or comments? I'm just going to say I have concerns. Um, I don't like that they can sell our, our, the data even after it's been aggregated or anonymized or whatever. And I, I their two-month response time just seems unacceptable. I mean, I wouldn't accept that from anybody I was doing business with personally. Um, so for me, I would rather see us do the surveys in-house and not sell our data or give our kids data away. But that's just my opinion. I think Joe brings up a good point. Um, would it, how much more would it be for us to create our own survey in-house and administer it? Because it, it is such a big survey, and so I think about how much time it also takes away from instruction twice a year. Um, and so, you know, condense it down to get the core pieces of the SEL piece versus all the different categories that are part of the panorama. So a couple of questions. So the survey um, for elementary, it took a little bit longer just because you have to input, you know, your user ID, which is their email address and things of that nature. But once they got into it, the platform only took about 10 to 12 minutes for the elementary kiddos to take. And it took under 10 minutes. That's all three because the surveys are not that long. And it took under 10 minutes for our middle school and high schoolers to, to take. So it wasn't you know, an extreme amount of time away from the instruction piece. Um, the first year we did it, Dr. Lee, we had an in-house survey um, that we used SurveyMonkey to do, and it was completely anonymous. Um, the data was okay, to be honest, but as you know, in comparison to Panorama, it's like night and day. And as far as us trying to match what Panorama provides, it's myself and it's it's Tim, right, Tim Brown. And so being able to do that would take a lot of, of time and resources and also creating it where the SEL is not anonymous so our counselors and social workers and principals can use the data to really work with those students. Um, how many families opted out? Is it, was it just a handful? It was around 100. About 100, okay. Is that families or children? Children, or sorry. Yes, thank you. And Joe, the, the two months, it, it, was, it was communication via that two months, so it wasn't a no response for two months. It was just a lot of back and forth because we didn't have that one point person because our account manager was promoted. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And you mentioned they now have a form yes. in about a 10-day period. So I, I did, um, that's how long it took this time. Uh -huh. So I, I received an email that talked about the, the parameters. I had to complete a Google form. I completed that and then they um, sent me an email saying we received it, we're working on it. That was last week and then yesterday around 3.30 they updated me that the student's data has been purged. So it took about a 10 day turnaround time. Any other questions? I guess. Do teachers and counselors find this, find Panorama, 
find the information helpful from Panorama? Have you gotten that kind of feedback from them? Do they find it helpful? Yeah, actually just to connect us back to our last meeting when Anna shared the um, counseling program evaluation, several of her recommendations were tied to Panorama, digging in further and then designing programming based on the information that they had received. I don't think it's being had, was used in year one at the teacher level, was it? I didn't think so. No, the it, it, it depended on the buildings. Okay. So a couple of our buildings did have presentations regarding the, the data on the, the teacher level. But the teachers, it was up to the principal to decide if the teachers had access to the data. So again, some buildings did and some buildings didn't. Any further questions? I guess I'd just say personally, if you can opt out and we can be very clear about the, the ability to opt out, then I don't, I don't see the, I mean, there's very minimal data that you can get in a, you know, the, the data that they would have would be comparable to the data that they get probably already um, via DESI or whatever. So I guess I feel like as long as the opt out is made clear, um, you know, I don't have a problem with it. And Alex, that's something that can definitely be done with the communications that Derek sends out in advance, definitely explaining opting out means you're opting out of the survey, but your child's data is still on the platform, yeah. as well as on the SIS. Ellen. Dr. Williamson, um, you brought up an interesting point to me there. You just mentioned that some buildings use it at the teacher level and some didn't. Was that because it was a pilot and it will be across mm -hmm. all buildings moving forward? Okay, good. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so moving forward into next year, we've reworked our school improvement plans that every building will have and there will be a goal attached to the social emotional piece which will include panorama. So Dr. Adams, will then teachers get some development around how to use panorama? And I think just for clarification too, I mean, I know you talked about the features of panorama um, and teachers being able to communicate with kids, but Canvas is still our primary LMS, right? Okay, because that feature would still, so the kids that opted out would not be impacted because if Canvas is still our LMS, that's the primary use for teachers to communicate instruction with kids, right? Correct, okay. correct. And correct to the professional development piece as well. All right, any other questions? Do we have a motion? Make a motion to approve the agreement with Panorama as presented. Second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? No. Okay. We have now finally reached our point for public comments. Thank you all for your patience with us this evening. Um, the school board welcomes questions, ideas, and comments from persons in attendance. Members of the audience may comment during the public portion of the meeting. We ask that comments be limited to three minutes in order to complete the agenda in a reasonable time. And we ask that comments begin by providing your name, address, and the school district in which you reside. Do we have anyone that would like to make a public comment? Come on up. Good evening, board. Um, Jamie Adamski, uh, Washington, Missouri, Washington School <laughs> District. <laughs> um, thank you so much for everything you guys do. Um, it's hard work, being on the board, tedious, and takes a lot of heart and patience, so thank you for that. Um, I have been a teacher in this district for 12 years. I have been the president of Webster Groves National Education Association for five of them. Um, I'm here tonight to uh, speak uh, somewhat on behalf of Missy Showalter. Those of us who are in the audience tonight um, wearing blue, that's her favorite color. We are here to support her. Um, we are kindly asking the board to overturn her termination to a resignation, afford her that opportunity. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about that. I uh, sent documents to you yesterday that I uh, trust you will look and take into consideration um, during that decision making later this evening. Um, I'm gonna share a personal story. For those of you guys who don't know, I was married once before. Um, I kept the ring. I swapped out the center stone for a peridot, which is the color green. 
green to me means growth. Um, and I look at this ring, and even though it comes from a failed marriage, uh, it is a constant reminder of where I am today, right? I failed forward, I grew from it. And we are doing so many great things in this district, we really are. But if we were doing everything so well, we would not be needlessly losing beloved educators. We have lost Melissa Rainey's, we have lost Margaret Piper's and Mudios, we have lost Missy e. Showalter's. And I think it's due to an issue with our board policies and fairness when they are being applied. Um, and so I'm just asking, can we please make those losses have meaning as we grow and get better? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to make a public? Courtney, come on up. Good evening. I'm Courtney Schaefer, and I live at Webster, in Webster Groves at 208 Oakwood. I'm here before you once again to speak on the Ill issue of bullying. Five years ago, I started supervising a social worker for LCSW Lysinger. I was extra excited because she was a fellow Indiana University alum, alumna. And at the time, Melissa Showalter, Missy, worked for legal services helping families with housing issues. But from the start, Missy talked about being a school social worker like I was at SSD. Fast forward a few years, and I was so excited to learn that Missy had become part of the Webster Grove School District social work team. I knew how amazing she was and what an asset she would be to the district. But today, I'm here to talk about bullying. And, what, and I was saddened to learn that Missy is no longer with the district due to bullying. Not the kind of bullying that happens between young people. No, I'm talking about the bullying that happens by adults. Bullying is a serious problem in our community. Since I have started speaking about bullying, I've been contacted by many people with personal stories about Webster Grove schools and bullying. These stories include children being physically hurt, children in federally protected classes being called names for, for who they are, and too many other examples to reference here tonight. But what I've also learned is that, but I have also learned that one of the reasons there is such a youth bullying problem in our schools is due to the fact that we have so many adult bullies in our community. We see it every day on social media, every week in the newspaper, during every election cycle. We know stories about emails and letters people receive, and individually we hear stories about neighbors, fellow community members, parents, and even some within the school district. Until we are willing to address the issues of adult bullying in our community, we will not make proper headway preventing bullying for our children. I have seen adult bullying in schools firsthand as a social worker, and as a social worker, our advocacy is a key part of the work. In fact, the NASW, the National Association for Social Workers, Code of Ethic holds up advocacy as a core pillar of the profession. When I was a school social worker, I was a fierce advocate for my teachers because I knew how critical they were to the students that I served. We worked as a team, and when those teachers were bullied by other adults and administrators, I worked to support them. That is why I was contacted earlier this week by a former colleague, now friend, who knew yet another story, which surprisingly involved Missy, about bullying in Webster Groves. This time, the story was about adults within the district. To prepare for this comment, I did a little research, it is, and it was easy to find information about adult bullying schools with quick, research, quick search. I found this 19, 2019 article by the Department of Education. As a school board, I hope you will ask questions and educate yourself about the pervasiveness of bullying in and around the Webster Grove School District and really push for change. And most importantly, please be open to show and show transparency about your work to address this issue. Protecting bullying behavior erodes trust, and trust is such a critical element to learning. And on a side note, at a time of directed attacks on the LGBTQ plus community, is it okay for an administrator in the Webster Grove School District to say being LGBTQ is a choice? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on up. Good evening. Uh, Dave Buck, 124 South Elm, Webster Grove School District. I'm the grandfather of uh, two kids who will be in uh, kindergarten and third grade at Bristol. 
Um, I've been beating this same drum for a long time, many years, but I am never giving up. Um, Martin Luther King famously said that he didn't want his own children to be judged by the color of their skin, by the content of their character, which begs the question, what is the true content of our entire school district's character, that's kids, adults, and parents, and what is the true character of our entire Webster Groves community's character? Breakthrough scholarly research clearly and irrefutably confirms that while intelligence and knowledge are still very important, character matters most in a student's success in school and life. Character is about the moral development of the heart and is defined by our values that guide our daily choices, decisions, and actions. Values such as honesty, kindness, acceptance, generosity, fairness, empathy, humility, courage, persistence, etc., etc., etc. However, as Courtney just shared, bullying reflects a different kind of character and values compri comprised of division, arrogance, superiority, meanness, negativity, and even hate. And without question, certain of our, quote, helicopter parents and adults are hovering over their kids and passing down their own bullying that they themselves practice and perpetuate as role models of the worst kind. And if you don't believe me, just go on Facebook and you'll see it for yourself. No child is born a bully or a racist. They learn this from their parents, their family, and their friends. One of the main ways that we can combat this is through character education, which has been proven in other school districts across the country that kids K through 12 can indeed learn, develop, and live the values and character that they are not getting at home. Just ask Grace, who is part of Character Plus. Bottom line, character can be, and Grace, you know this, can be successfully taught and adopted as positive learned behavior for an entire lifetime. I am a big practitioner of market research. Alex, I learned this at Ralston Perina. While I personally wish character education was made mandatory right now, next year, in every class, at every grade level, I urge you instead to at least pilot test it first, which I don't think this district tests enough stuff. Test it in one class, in one grade, in one school, for one year, then read the pre-post results and either expand it or discontinue it accordingly. In conclusion, there are multiple solutions to the epidemic of bullying and poor character. To me, just like with gun violence, bullying is a human violence problem caused by a different kind of disease that affects the human heart. Please, I am here. I hate the word re resigned. I have evolved to a higher level of consciousness and creativity. I am here to help you in this regard in any way I can. I made that offer about teaching creativity. District, nobody's taken me up on it. It's been a year. Too bad, except Kara Seavey at Thrive. Thank you, Kara. I really appreciate that. But I'm here to help you in character education any way I can. Just let me know and I'll be there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else like to make a public comment? Hi, Margaret Piper Zamudio. I live in St. Charles. I'm no longer a Webster Groves um, School District employee. Um, I did want to speak, though, on the pattern, I would say, that has emerged here. So you all know my story. I shared it last time. Um, I'm here really to speak on Missy's behalf. One of just an incredible, incredible person. When we talk about um, the social emotional learning, right? And the resources that are out there, Missy knew what those were. And she was making those connections for students at three different schools. So um, thank you, Missy. Um, 
when we talk about character, like he just talked about, um, we think about this district and there are a lot of amazing things that Webster does, but I worry about the leadership level, um, what's going on. We talk about the growth mindset. I said that last time. We, we preach that to our kids. You know, we're learning and it's okay to fail and this is character building. And <clears throat> when I'm not told for an entire school year what I've done wrong until I'm at my summative evaluation and then told that I'm terminated and then stuff happens with Missy where she is trying, she's advocating for other employees, for her colleagues, and she is trying to do good things, and all of a sudden she's terminated. That's not, that's not right. It's not what we teach our kids. That's really what it comes down to. So, um, yeah, there's bias application of board policy. Um, there should be fair practices there should be progressive punishment, right? Oh, you did something wrong, let me tell you, let me give you feedback. Um, you know, it was only through observations, through evaluations that I was given feedback, was never had any verbal conversations, whereas Missy was never observed. Not once, not told of anything that she was doing or not doing. So, I just want I just like the character piece, because that's really what it comes down to. We want to raise good human beings, and there are so many incredible students in Webster Groves, and I will miss them, and so many incredible colleagues, and um, we need to hold leadership accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to make a public comment? Come on up. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tim Mathis. I am a Webster resident. I live at 736 East Jackson with my wife, Tasha. I am a close friend of Missy Showalter, and I'm here to support her today. Um, I don't have much to say. Um, I don't have a kid in the school district, but I am a taxpayer, and I think my opinion matters. And what happened is such a great injustice to this community. What Missy does for this community is invaluable. And if it isn't corrected, it's a true shame. It is a true shame. And I think that if it's not corrected, you need to look at yourselves and really think about it. Really think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other Public comments? Anybody behind the TV? No? Okay. Thank you all. Um, we also have some written public comments. Hopefully, you all have had a chance to look over those. And um, now we are at the point of the consent agenda. I will motion to approve consent agenda items. 5 5.01, 5.02, 5.03, 5.04, 5.05, 5.06, 5.07, 5.08, 5.9, 5.10, 5.11, 5.12. Still getting there. One second. Five. 5 point 13, 5.14, 5.15, 5.16, 5.17, 5.18, 5.19, 5.20, 5.21, 5.22, 5.23. I think that's it. Second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I'll abstain. All right. One abstention. All right. Um, I need a motion to recess into executive session for the purposes of discussing personnel and legal matters. So moved. Second. All those in favor, roll call. 
Say Alan. Yes. Anita. Yes. Joe. Yes. Christine. Yes. Grace. Yes. Alex. Yes. All right.